Good morning. My name is Beth Waterman. I'm speaking to you from the Angling Collection in the Phoenicia Library. 25 years ago, I was one of the founders of this collection, uh, which consists of many books, more than 800 books, uh, memorabilia about important anglers from this region. We have a lender rod program. Uh, you can check out fly fishing or spinning rods. Um, but our mission is to preserve the history and tradition of the culture of fly fishing in the Catskills. And in, in doing that, we have created a website and we, on our website, we have a lot of interesting history. We have a match the hatch chart, which is award winning. And we have a series of programs like this one, which have been recorded and archived on the website. That's under the news and events tab. And we will post the website at the end of this program, but if you want to write it down, it's catskillanglingcollection.org. I'd like to thank the Catskill Watershed Corporation, who in partnership with New York City Department of Environmental Protection have provided funding for us to put on this program. This is our first program since 2019. Um, and today we are doing it by Zoom. Those of you who are watching can type in questions into the chat box and we will respond to those questions at the end of Bert's presentation. Today I have with me Brett Berry from from what's the name of the place? Silver Hollow Audio. Silver Hollow Audio, thank you. Um, it's Brett does our technical work and today he's handling both the camera and the audio. And Stephanie Blackman. <laughs> Stephanie does our web posting and designs our flyers. And Mark Lodi. Mark is the president of Ashokan Papacton Trout Watershed Chapter. Watershed Trout Chapter Trout of Trout mm -hmm. Unlimited. <laughs> as well as being a local fishing guide and photographer. And I am Beth Waterman, as I said, and our guest today is Bert Darrow. Uh, Bert, Bert is the president of Theodore Gordon Fly Fishers. He is the past president of the Catskill Fly Fishing Center and Museum, a permanent director and past president of the Catskill Mountain Trout Unlimited, a protector of cold water fisheries, environmental activist, well-traveled angler, licensed guide, and author. So I am very happy that we are able to present this to you today and grateful to Bert that he can be with us. Thank, Bert. Th thank you, Beth. Uh, I'm going to try and talk uh, a little bit about Theodore Gordon, his life, you know, and how he got involved with fly fishing and how he became to be known as the father of dry fly fishing in America. Um, he was born May 1st, 1915, or excuse me, uh, September 18th, 1854. Uh, was an American writer who fished the Catskill region of New York State in the late 19th century through the earliest 20th century. Though he never published a book, Gord is often called the father of the American school of dry fly fishing. He wrote numerous articles for the Fishing Gazette from 1890 and published works in Forest and Stream from 1903, sometimes under the pseudonym of Badger Hackle. And uh, now he is buried in New York Marble Cemetery on 2nd Avenue between East 2nd and 3rd Streets in New York City. <clears throat> Gordon was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on September 18, uh, 1854. Uh, he had imported English fly fishing tackle and flies. He altered the English flies to precisely match the insects hatching in the Never Sink and Beaverkill Rivers and Willowemock Creek. Later, he made his own flies from scratch. 
Gordon taught himself to tie flies by studying the American Angler's Book, 1864, by Thaddeus Norris. He also read uh, British fly fishing ang literature of the time and corresponded with notable British fly anglers Frederick M. Halford and G.E.M. Skews to perfect his fly fishing school. Known as a consumptive hermit, Gordon lived his final years and died on May 1, 1915 in the Anson Knight House in Bradley, New York. This is one of his residents that had to be abandoned during the development of the Never Sink Reservoir, which flooded several former villages. It was developed to provide water for New York City. In the late 1800s, Theodore Gordon began fishing the Never Sink in New York State. He represents the major figure in the transition from wet fly, excuse me, uh, from wet to dry fly fishing in the United States. Although fishing with a dry fly had been mentioned by Thaddeus Norris in the American Angler's Book in 1865 and in several uh, other authors, Gordon became uh, the great practitioner of the technique after he received a number of dry flies by English, uh, Englishman Frederick Halford in 1890. Based on British insects, Halford's flies poorly imitated American hatches, but Gordon embraced the innovative technique and began the arduous study of native entomology that resulted in many indigenous patterns, including the most famous, the Quill Gordon. And so now I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I had asked a friend of mine, an author, uh, his name is John Gubbins, and this is a book that he authored, The American Fly Fishing Experience, and it's all about Theodore Gordon. It's an excellent book, it's very well written, and it's very well researched. So I, I've gotten to know John for some time now, and I, after writing this book, I asked him <clears throat> if he had, you know, a good idea, you know, why, you know, Gordon had a preference for dry flies. So here's what he wrote. Four factors contributed to Gordon's preference for dry flies. First, trout are sight feeders. Second, and this is very important, the waters of the Catskills are when optimum crystal clear. Third, he was heavily influenced by Halford's preaching that the dry fly fishing was the most scientific way to fish. Halford's preachings were influenced by leading British anglers of the Victorian period. Fourth, during his last years, most trout Catskill rivers were planted or holdovers after being planted. They were hatched uh, and raised in New York State uh, trout fisheries. Taking these four factors into account, Gordon would have determined that dry fly fishing was the most effective way to fish. I am drawing heavily on my experience of the willow and the beaver kill uh, when I describe Catskill rivers as clear water. But the literature of the time and my experience of other waters here in the Midwest and far west support angling writer's opinion of the period that the Catskills produced very clear streams. I know when I was there, I was often mistaken trying to judge the depth of rivers. They were often deeper than I judged. Our Midwestern rivers are described as tea stained year round. I was used to seeing water which grew darker as it grew deeper, not so in the Catskills. Combine this factor with one other of my four factors that trout feed on what they can see. A safe conclusion to draw is that trout can see more in Catskill waters than elsewhere. Thus, in shallower sections of a river, they can easily see what is on the surface. Now combine these factors with the way trout are raised in hatcheries. Most Catskill trout in Gordon's day were planted. There are probably some natural reproduction, of course, holdovers from the hatchery fish. Hatchery are, fish, are fed from above, and thus planted trout will be conditioned to experience a surface disturbance at dinner call. Thus, hatchery raised fish will always be looking up for their next meal. Wild trout, on the other hand, are frightened by surface disturbance and will sound. They also look everywhere for food, midwater and bottom included. Hatchery trout will, unlike wild trout, be drawn to surface disturbance and even shift upward in the water column to investigate disturbances. Finally, Gordon wanted to make his mark as a foremost angler of the period. To win respect abroad, he needed to follow Halford and a school, at least in the Fishing Gazette articles. It is interesting to note that Halford started trout hatcheries at his fishing club 
and he fed them from above. Thus they were surface focused and so conditioned to fit in what is dry fly, about his dry fly theories. And I, I just wanna say one thing. I've been here, and, and Mark, you probably have too, when they've stocked the rivers, okay? And I watched it one time some 20 years ago, and what I found most interesting is one of the folks that was hired to work on this went and got, after we you know, dumped a whole bunch of them in the Esopus, right? Got some very fine gravel where the fish have been dumped in and they turn and they school up. They stay in a bunch, right? And he took this fine gravel and you could see them swimming around and he threw, and I say, like size of pellets, threw it in the water and all of a sudden it started to boil. The fish did not know they were rocks, but they saw something the size of the pellets coming in and all of a sudden they were looking for the food. And so he was very right about that. They are definitely surface, surface feeders, and I, I think comes out of the hatchery. Among Gordon's contributions to fly fishing was a sparse fly which could be uh, fished wet and dry. Today we'd call a, fish, a fly fish just under the surface an emerger. An insect making its way to the surface hatch. I would add to that uh, the prevalence of cripples among mayfly hatches. Some species produce a greater percentage of cripples. I believe the sulfurs produce the highest percentage. And I think we've probably seen that on, on a river ourselves. Yes, we yeah. have. And that's something that happens. Should their emergence be hampered in any way, they will still rise to the surface. But if unable to crawl on the surface, they will just hang under the surface, void by the oxygen. Thus the need for sparse fly, fish barely wet, or now is what we call emergers. This is the best I can do with the question. Knowing Gordon, as I do, I believe he fished dry fly because he caught more fish, dry fly fishing than other, any other way. He was, as they say in philosophy, results oriented. <laughs> and, and he was, okay? So the forerunner of this process was Thaddeus Norris, uh, who in 19, or excuse me, 1864 published a book, Death and Change, the Angling Concept in America. In this treaty, which encompassed several fishing techniques and tackle to chase after different fish, fish species. Norris included in the book an important chapter in fly fishing as well as uh, fly suggestive fish in different seasons, emulating in some ways what was made by Alfred Ronalds and his fly angler's entomology. Obviously, Norris didn't miss the point out that flies unsuitable <coughs> for fishing American brook trout. The simple selection he made allowed the novice to avoid many flops frequent attempts and with British flies, okay, <clears throat> which were uh, imagined for a completely different river environment and a very different kind of trout. And by that, what he's saying in uh, Britain and in a lot of places in Europe and Ireland, the rivers, what they call rivers there, we would call brooks here. They're not really large rivers. And so uh, they would look at it, it was easy to fish a lot of times right from shore without even getting in. And uh, maybe did some dapping in, I don't know. But the big change came to this country when brout trout or, or, trout or European trout were introduced. They were definitely sight feeders. Uh, they were aggressive. Uh, they grew well, they were strong. And so once they were introduced in the United States, I believe it was in 1883, they were brought in on a ship from Germany, and they were planted in the east and gradually moved west and made a big difference. So uh, when uh, <coughs> Gordon saw this, okay, he then decided, you know, these brown trout, what they like to do, that was part of his decision of fishing on top, I believe, you know, as opposed to uh, fishing underneath. Even after he became known as the father of dry fly fishing, or, you know, somebody that really, you know, uh, was happy to do that, you know, joyful to do that, right? He still maintained his fly fishing underneath with wet flies. He developed a, a streamer called the Bumble Puppy. A lot of people thought that he just gave up, you know, uh, the previous fishing that he had done, but in fact he didn't. He kept up with wet fly fishing and he did some uh, streamer fishing. Uh, so anyway, these eggs arrived in February 1883 in a cold cargo hold of a vessel called Wera sent out from Germany, which unloaded some 80,000 uh, Salmotrata farlow 
eggs coming from the black forest hatchery. Very uh, soon through subsequent um, <coughs> uh, import from Europe in stock and brown trout spread first in many uh, east coast rivers, reaching urbanization, their faster growth rate, uh, and their natural greed put them in great competition with the native species, brook trout on the east coast and cutthroat on the west coast, okay? So uh, Gordon was seeing this, and he moved uh, some, I think, 20 years before he passed away, he moved to the Neversink and he lived uh, at different uh, places at the Neversink. He made his money uh, by tying flies and doing writing, some writing. Unfortunately, uh, he was a very good writer, but unfortunately he never wrote a book. But uh, as a book that you have there, uh, his writings did turn, you know, John McDonald's book did turn into a book, uh, which is an excellent book. Show the case. You know, Here's a handsome slip case, the complete fly fisherman. Notes and letters of Theodore Gordon. First published in 1946. Right. And beautiful little clock mount version. This version is from the Theodore Gordon Fly Fishers Club, published 1970. It shows the volume of his writing. He really did, these are his collected, yes. published let and preserved letters. And it really shows how prolific he was. He kept many letters. Oh, yes. Yeah. One, of the, one of the things uh, about uh, Gordon, he was uh, almost a hermit. You know, he didn't really go out and do things, a lot of things with other people. He had friends that he liked to correspond with, and he had one or two people that he fished with. <clears throat> but basically, he, he lived a hermetic life on the Neversink River. And why did he move to the Neversink in the first place? He, I think he moved there, uh, one of the things I read is because of health reasons. Mm -hmm. He had tuberculosis, and the mountain air was supposed to have been good for him there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was uh, one of the primary mo reasons that he did move there uh, to you know, the Neversink and, and fished on the Catskill Rivers to get away from city life. Uh, he was born in Pittsburgh, Ultimately, he wound up moving, his family moved to Savannah, Georgia. And then from there, <clears throat> uh, he was a stock trader, broker. And uh, his family, which was rather wealthy, uh, almost ran out of funds. And his mother uh, moved them north. I think it was New Jersey or New York. And they lived with her uncle for a while. And then from there, he came up to the Catskills and the Neversink and started his, his fishing. Interesting co uh, color quote from the letters that Theodore Gordon was just mentioned. Huh. He says, from working night and day by electric light one year in Wall Street, my sight is much impaired and sometimes you do not see the fly arise of the trout until too late. Right. <laughs> from those, those damn electric lights. <laughs> right, <eyesight>. right, <laughs> right. So anyway, some aspects of life had been known by, uh, known, uh, Luckily, thanks to very few friends who hung out with him in the last years of his life, others come from guesswork, suppositions, or thanks to uh, uh, that very human habit to enrich legends with other legends. He was born in Pennsylvania, which he said in 54, uh, and moved to Savannah, Georgia. He was an insurance broker. And uh, what happened was there was a bankruptcy of the uh, railroads, uh, which they think really led to his family and him losing money in the stock market. So he decided to move to the Catskill Mountain region, and there he reigned for the rest of his days. Okay, on the banks of the Neversink River, he lived for uh, 20 years, almost in complete solitude, staying in various boarding houses, ending his days suffering from tubo tuberculosis at the Anson Night House, where he died in 1915, okay? Um, and so uh, one of the things that happened with him he was casting, he was used to using wet flies, and uh, he took, I guess, a set of wet flies, okay, casting, instead of the classic downstream fishing, he soon realized that his flies could float, his wet flies, okay? They could be dried with a false cast, and when just tied up and yet not soaked with water, they were promptly grabbed by trout, especially during hatches, by casting his wet flies upstream. 
and that was something, you know, and he, he remembers this stuff, which is good, how you, you know, can do something like that. And so he moved on from there, you know. How do I get to get these fish to come up? And then he goes to different types of materials, and then different types of materials went into feathers, you know, material that he used to, for bodies, everything like that, you know. And uh, I think you have a fly that he's known for today, forever. <laughs> Can you get this? The classic Quill Gordon. <laughs> Hold that up against that white shirt. Can you get that? This is a classic Quill Gordon dry fly. A little bit of camera work here. We have this in a vise. Uh, full confession, this one was tied by me, it was tied by Orvis. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is the progenitor of the classic Catskill dry fly shape that started the Catskill dry fly revolution that has now spread over right. the world. And um, I can also show you some photographs. <clears throat> this is the Epiorus pluralis mayfly. At the time, the uh, Latin uh, entomology was the iron frauditor. Iron frauditor. Uh, it has since been right. reclassified as the Epiorus pluralis mayfly. Uh, it's the family of Fimbaridae, the genus Epiorus and species Pluralis. And this is the modern Quill Gordon that imitates this fly. And curiously, this is, this is a Quill Gordon tied by Theodore Gordon. Right. And you'll notice the sparseness of the wing, the swift, swept back wing, the sparseness, sparseness of the hackle, which represents the legs of the mayfly. And if you could zoom back, here is the modern iteration. So that's a good indication of how these fly dressings morph, morph over time, morph over the types of uh, materials involved. So this is the mo this is the modern iteration of the. Quill Gordon dry fly. Now it's called the Quill Gordon because obviously it was designed by Theodore Gordon, but the the uh, abdomen here, which represents the abdomen of the mayfly, uh, is actually the quill of a single feather from a peacock, where right. the feather part is stripped off. Only the quill is left, and wrapped around the hook rep clearly represents the abdominal features, the segmented abdominal features of the actual insect. So this is how this is how we imitate. This is how we imitate that guy there in today's modern fly tying entomology. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so another another name for it is the quill Gordon, but they also are Gordon's quill. Right. I refer to it two different names. And so <clears throat> Gordon's continuous search for ideal hackles for dry flies start in the coming years to the genetic sec selection of roosters which can produce feathers with stiff and glossing fibers. Gordon did not hold himself back only to change the structure and materials of the English fly dressing, but started to select flies which could match local insects in terms of colors and sizes. And that was a real big thing they did, was working with colors and sizes of flies, especially for the Catskills, and that's where that fly came from. And, and that was a big thing because I don't know if the English really did that, but he was one that really had an eye for that, to match it color-wise. And uh, the other thing is he talked about, you know, lighting and, you know, different colors that the fish could see and how he would vary even a Quill Gordon's body color, you know, for them for different times of day. So he's not only a master angler, he's also a master entomologist. Yes, absolutely. In one of the books that we have in the library, it says that he preceded he, his, he matched the hatch 50 years before Ernie Schwiebert. Right, oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. That, so. that was, I think, one of his greatest contributions, you know, being able mm -hmm. to do that, look at it, and say, you know what, here's how, you know, he, we can make this better, I can make this better, you know, for catching fish. Mm -hmm. um, despite his confessed, I think I said this before, preference for dry fly and for theories of the exact imitation, Gordon never repudiated his past wet flies, remaining for all his life a real complete angler. 
and never turning his nose to use wet flies and streamers when hatchets were lacking. And one of his streamers, the bumble puppy, could be considered one of the first imitations which want a combination of feathers and fur created for pike fishing. I thought that was very interesting. Yes. The bumble puppy showed itself excellent on smaller hooks for big brown trout. So Gordon is not only a spiritual father of American dry fly fishing culture, but also a great innovator in stream fishing uh, technique. Uh, <clears throat> in the last years of his life, Gordon made a living, <coughs> excuse me, tying, <coughs> living tying flies that were sold for about one and a half dollars a dozen, a buck and a half a dozen. It's quite moving thinking that he died nearly without a brass in his pocket and now his rare flies that seldom appear in various auctions are sold at very significant figure. Uh, but this has always been the destiny of many artists. Um, so he was, when I think about him, you know, <clears throat> myself, I was happy that he did this because I prefer dry fly fishing myself and I sometimes wonder if that's out of laziness, or, but uh, what I really like about dry flies is the part that I don't have to use weight, right? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so I'm going to use a different analogy here. <clears throat> Usually when I talk about the difference between dry flies and wets, it's on one subject. But it's like <clears throat> if you can imagine yourself in a, a big dark room, okay? and uh, there's a beautiful orchestra that's playing and you could hear the music and that's with lights off and isn't it much better to turn the lights on and see the orchestra playing so I call that lights off lights on so you get to see a visual thing when you catch a fish on a dry fly as opposed when you catch a fish underneath it's like what I call lights off you know it feels good, you know, you can see it, hear it, whatever, right? But you really don't get the visual of the fish, you know, first seeing the fish, the target of what you want to do, having the fish come up and take it. And so I call it lights on fishing. You actually get to see the fish take it. And I think that's probably something that he liked as well, finding the fish that he wanted to catch as opposed to throwing the fly out there, you know, hmm. and hopefully something happens. <laughs> You know? That's a great analogy. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not as deeply into this, so I just consider myself a dry fly snob. That's, that's my explanation. Yeah. <laughs> You're much more deeply into this. Thank you. Yeah. So, but, but I enjoy it, and, uh, and most of the people that I've taken fishing as, as a guide, you know, uh, I, I like to do that, you know, because as a guide yourself, you know, uh, that you can take them to a river, and there are days when there are flies that are not working on the surface. Yeah. And so now you put on something that's subsurface, like, you know, uh, Gordon did. And hopefully you catch something. But I've been on a couple of boat rides out in Montana where you float the day and nothing happens, right? And so uh, when I take somebody fishing, I always like to take them to a place I know there are fish and they can see it, right. you know? And they can see the fish take the fly as opposed to well, especially for beginners, because that visual cue is a much more right. effective learning tool right. than trying to imagine where this fly, what's happening to this fly subsurface where you can't see it. And also, you can't see the hit. With a dry fly, you can see the hit, and a right. new angler can set the hook. And, and that, that's the whole thing that I really, you know, uh, try to key in on, is that you get to see that, you know? Uh, well, um, Bert, I don't, I want to, I don't want to put push you or rush you or anything, but I do want to say that Bert has been president of Theodore Gordon Fly Fishers for 13 or 14 years, and he can tell us, a, I'd like to know, have you tell us a little bit about that organization okay. and the kinds of things that it does. And okay. Uh, the Theodore Gordon Fly Fishers, it was the first uh, fly fishing conservation organization in New York State. It was founded almost 60 years ago, uh, in 1963, by a, a great uh, group of people. <clears throat> and, and what we do today, it's progressed, it's changed, evolved. And today we're involved in uh, a number of different things. Uh, one is education. 
Gordon was also known himself as a conservationist. He wanted, you know, the rivers and the stream beds taken care of, and that's, you know, some of what we do, you know, and we've done a lot of work with Trout Unlimited chapters, you know, around uh, New England. Uh, we've done it with a chapter out in Cape Cod, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Connecticut, uh, and, and many different places. We try to help them out with uh, stream improvement projects. <clears throat> Along with that, uh, we have an educational program. And uh, for instance, is, uh, this year we'll be giving out two scholarships for advanced degrees, masters or above or legal degrees, to people who are going on to work, do environmental work. And we give uh, two $5,000 scholarships. And it's called the Founders Fund Award. Nice. Okay. Along with that, uh, this year, we gave out two awards uh, to two high schools, uh, two $1,000 awards to the Roscoe High School, you know, two seniors, and uh, to Livingston Manor High School, two seniors also, that are going on to, you know, study, you know, past high school. Mm -hmm. And usually, it turns out to be the students with the highest science average is what it is, mm -hmm. okay? <clears throat> and lastly, <clears throat> what we do is we have been involved, which you know, in a number of different uh, legal uh, suits, lawsuits, okay? One of them uh, dealing something very close here, the portal, okay, up there, uh, put out silt for many years. And at one time, the, uh, the DEP said, or excuse me, the DEC said, there are over 10,000 trout per mile in the Esopus Creek, more than any other two rivers in the Northeast put together. 90 some percent of those trout were rainbows. And now the numbers drop down to maybe around 3,000 trout per mile. And most of those trout are no longer rainbows. There are browns, and a big portion of those are uh, stock browns, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and that happened because of, you know, silt that was coming from this Cary Reservoir through the portal and out into the Esopus Creek. And basically what it did is it smothered uh, the eggs from trout and it made it hard for trout to breathe, all the silt in the water. So <clears throat> uh, we, TGF, along with, the, actually started with the Catskill Mountains chapter, sued New York City under the Clean Water Act. And ultimately what happened was the case wound up going to the U.S. Supreme Court and we won our case. New York City had to pay a fine, a penalty, and they had to fix the problem. And what I think that has finally been fixed. I think they've turned on the, the new intake for the portal. And I think the water's supposed to be, but it took like 20 years almost to get that to happen. So those are some of the things that we do legally. So we do legal work, we do educational work, okay? And, uh, and stream improvements. Stream improvements, yeah. Right. So. And then uh, let's mention that uh, New York State, um, starting in uh, 2021, has reimagined uh, and re-engineered their, their trout management regulations. Right. And so for the first time this year, uh, the Esopus Creek has been designated a totally wild fishery. So right. now they are not stocking these brown trout. Right. Uh, and this will be, and this uh, pertains to what you were saying earlier about the uh, site fishing of the trout and also the stock trout that respond to the upward movement right. of any motion right. on top. Right. So for the first time this year, we, the Sopus Creek fishery is absent these uh, typically, and it's typically 15,000 stocked brown trout. Right. Uh, and it's being reverted to a wild trout fishery. And the expectation is that when you don't dump all these <clears throat> uh, satry trout onto the wild trout fishery, the wild trout fishery will eventually uh, far uh, subsume the numbers that you could possibly stock on top of them. So the Sopus Creek, to my mind, has become this huge uh, fisheries management experiment right, starting right. this year. So right. uh, upcoming years will tell the tale. Now, in terms of the catch rate this year, I think it's been suppressed somewhat because we haven't had these hatchery browns swimming around. Right. Uh, we've been catching a lot more rainbows, uh -huh. smaller rainbows. Um, so to be continued, this is a huge uh, uh, fisheries experiment. management ex yeah. Ex yeah. experiment is being watched all over the country. Yeah. Yeah.
the yeah. results here. I, I, I think it uh, will improve, you know, over time, you know. How much it, time do you think? <laughs> a couple <of> years? <laughs> uh, it's going to take a few years, you know. Years. Uh, yeah, I, I would, you know, and what I'd, I've always wanted to see is the rainbow population come back to some extent to where it was. Uh, is, you know, w when I started fishing uh, a little while ago, 50, 50 some years ago in the Esopus Creek, you could have a good day, there were so many trout, and it was kind of a, a crazy thing. Uh, you'd catch a trout near 79 inch rainbows, mostly, right? Mm -hmm. And if you caught so many 79 inch rainbows, say 70 of them in a day, you might catch maybe, yeah, oh yeah. 70. Oh yeah, it was How did you even keep count? <laughs> oh, because yeah, that's what... So it, it was really, it was like, what would happen is you take the fish off, right? You drop it in, put, you know, rod under arm, drop the fly, put the fish back, and I don't know how many times, not a huge amount, but enough times, drop the fly in, and other fish would take it. It was absolutely, it was crazy. Wow. I mean, it was, but that was with over 10,000 trout per mile, but that was averaged out. You went right. in certain places, and there were huge numbers of fish, huge numbers of fish, you know, yeah. and mostly rainbows, which were a lot of fun. They would jump around and whatever, and they're exciting, you know, uh, to catch. So if you so, feel the difference oh, I'm sorry. between then and now is the, the oscillation, primarily the turbidity. Pardon me? You feel the difference between the catch rate between then, the population rate between then and now is primarily the turbidity? Oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. And when they did the shocking studies, they found out their, one of the reasons the catch rate's down is because the population dropped off tremendously. Right. And the little rainbows, seven to nine inch rainbows, uh, they would come out of everywhere. You know, you could watch them. To give you an idea, if you went to Boysville, and we're maybe 200 feet above uh, the bridge, Five Arches Bridge, and you looked upstream on a sunny evening, you would think that there was a sun shower going on. And there's all these little noses coming up. And I was absolutely amazed. I tried to take pictures of it, but it looked like there were so many splashes, not splashes, but dinks in the water. Rises. It looked like, you know, a rain shower, but it hmm. wasn't. Huh. Just hundreds and wow. hundreds of fish. Huh. Wow. I haven't seen that lately. <laughs> no, oh, no. And I think that, like I say, I look forward to seeing, you know, the rainbows come back because they are great fun, you know. And not that the browns were harder to catch because, you know, I caught my fair share of browns also, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, one person that remembers those days also is a friend of mine out in West Yellowstone. His name is Bob Jacklin. Mm -hmm. You know him? And he used to come up from New Jersey just to fish the Esopus. And uh, when I uh, told him about what was going on, and he asked me, he said, same thing, he says, Bert, do you think we'll ever have those 80, 90, 100 day fish days, you know? I, and this is after the silt. And I said, I really can't say, Bob, you know, but it just dropped off tremendously, you know, yeah. because of the silt. It was a shame. Um, yeah. Shall we see, do we have any questions in our chat box? I, I think maybe it's time to give our, our viewers a chance to okay. ask some questions here, because I think fascinating, every detail is fascinating, but we, we are somewhat limited right. in time. So Stephanie is going to review the questions and present them to us. And I just wanted to say that the books we've referred to today are all available here at the library. You can check them out through the Mid-Hudson <laughs> Library system or by visiting the library. And there was one detail in, in the book, um, which is edited by Arnold Gingrich, called American Trout Fishing, Theodore Gordon. and uh, it mentioned that Theodore Gordon was a little man, less than five feet three inches tall, less than a hundred pounds, and he could roll a Bull Durham cigarette in one hand while, <laughs> while doing something else with the other hand. So this presents a colorful image of the man. Um, again, a small, a small man, but perhaps not that unusual at that time. Right. And that was a talent which allowed him to apparently tie flies on the stream uh -huh. single-handedly, <laughs> holding oh, yeah. his yeah. fingers. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. You ready for questions? Yes. Okay. Um, 
Um, we did have a question about what bird the quill is from, but it was answered by one of the other uh, visitors. It was a peacock. Is that correct? Peacock. Not peacock. And, well, uh, strip, strip peacock. Next question is, is from Christian Peterson. Uh, one of the few photos we have of Gordon shows him fishing the Never Sink with a young woman. Are there theories on who this person may be and what Gordon's connection to her was? There are theories, but no conclusive well, evidence. The one thing that we know for certain about her, it wasn't Paris Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> We know that. Other than that, we don't know who she was. <laughs> no. Okay. And, and apparently she didn't uh, have a great role in his life. He didn't write no. about her or anything. No. And that's the only... only they didn't even know where she came from, you know, basically, yeah. Right. And I want to note, too, she is fishing with a skirt. Is that right? <laughs> yes, she was, correct. And probably a bustle. <laughs> okay, another question from Christian Peterson. Is it true that the only fly rod owned by Gordon, still known to exist, is held at the American Museum of Fly Fishing? Is it what now? The, the only, only fly rod, rod ever known. The owned owned by Gordon. Ever known to have been owned by Gordon. Yeah, is that at the American Museum of Fly Fishing? He says, I think if memory a... serves me correct, there was another Gordon rod held by the Anglers Club of New York, which was destroyed yes. during the yep. bombing of Francis Tavern in the 70s. Right. There's the Anglers Club has, you know, tackle of his, mm -hmm. and also my friend Theodore Gordon Peck also has flies, which I had hoped to bring up, oh. and a rod of his. Uh-huh. Yeah. Real. So there's more than one rod yes. known to be owned yes. by Theodore Gordon. Okay. Uh, question, um, I can't quite make G.L. Gooby, what's that name? Um, do you believe Theodore Gordon was the founder of what is now called the Catskill School of Fly Tying? Catskill what? School, School of, of Fly, fly time. time. That's, that's a tough question. I mean, he developed, you know, flies that we use today, dry flies. So I guess he might have been one of the original people to, to uh, do I'd say more so than anybody else. Yeah, oh, if, yeah. If, if you want to assign that title, yeah. it should be Theodore Gordon. Yeah. And, and again, that, that Quill Gordon, that style, was the first iconic Catskill right. style that has now swept the world. I'd say that's a yes. Yeah. Okay, we have another question from Kathy Nolan. What role does catch and release play in building up trout populations? Are regulations requiring catch and release helpful? And how should we weigh those benefits against any harms to people who fish to eat? <laughs> say, <laughs> yes, you know, say that question again. Okay, I mean, I as you look at me. <laughs> You can. Well, I have to read it. So. Oh, okay, yeah. She's asking what role uh, catch and release plays in building up trout populations, and are oh, regulations okay. requiring catch and release helpful, and how should we weigh those benefits against any harms to people who fish to eat? Uh, catch and release, one of the things that uh, Theodore Gordon Fly Fishers does, and I think Trout Unlimited does also, Absolutely. really promote the idea of catch and release, okay? And uh, fish will survive after they're caught. If they're released well, they're not played too hard, you know, uh, they will survive. Um, and what was the other part of the question? Um, uh, let's see, are regulations requiring catch and release helpful? And how should we weigh those benefits against any harms to people who fish to eat? Subsistence fishing. Just yeah. fish to eat? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I think Gordon kept fish, not that makes it right or wrong, you know. Uh, I've seen people on rivers do things that are totally wrong. And, and what I mean by that is if the limit is five, they'll take five and put them in their cooler and then they'll move two miles down the road and take five more. You know, one time I actually saw that happening and I turned somebody in on a beaver kill when, when I saw that happening. So. Um, I think if, you know, if people, when, when I want to have fish, I could probably catch fish to eat. But there's a store in uh, Kingston called Adams. They have a great fish department. <laughs> and, and that's what I highly recommend. You know, go, you know, go to the store if you can. If the the, the uh, sentiment, uh, certainly in the fly fishing community, and I think spreading to other parts of the fishing community, 
Because, oh, 95, 90, maybe 99% of fly fishermen today it, it goes practice back. catch and release. Yes. I, mean, I, as a guy, completely ca right. teach catch and release to my clients. And I tell my clients, I'll show you where to catch a fish, how to catch a fish, but I refuse to ca kill a fish for you. Right. And uh, what, what I find is that when a lot, a lot of people say, oh, no problem, I'll kill the fish. First trout they catch, they set the hook, they play the fish. We get the fish in their hands. We take the big grip of grin. I show them how to release the fish. The fish swims away. I say, wait a second, I thought you wanted to kill that fish and take him home. <laughs> Invariably, they say, I wouldn't kill that fish. He ate my fly. <laughs> so uh, there's this owner ownership that yeah, right. quickly evolves yeah. when you hold these fish in your hand. There's, there, there's something else. Yeah. Okay. One, one other thing, just yeah, sure. about uh, catching fish, and you probably know this. Most of people uh, that I've taught to fish, you know, and have been fishing, spin fishing, whatever, they'll take the rod and they hold it up in the air like this, right? And what that does is it really wears the fish out because I think it was Joan Wolf says, or Lee, you're trying to bring that fish into our world, and it fights harder, and maybe the water's warmer, and so you have a better chance of killing it. So if you have a fish on, and you want to bring it in, you can still have a bend in your rod by putting it down close to the water, the tip, or in the water. And you'll find out the fish will come to you more quickly by doing that mm -hmm. than up like this. Mm -hmm. And you can put it back much more quickly in better shape with a rod tip right close to the water. Interesting. Well, that's course, good advice. And of course, Joan's uh, uh, former husband, Lee, said that a uh, game fish is too valuable to, to catch, catch only once. once. Right. Yeah. And we find that certainly true in the Esopus Creek. <laughs> right. Well, I think that kind of brings our program to a close for today. I want to announce that tomorrow at 2.30, we're having another Zoom program. This will be with Preston Wallheater, who as a young man learned to, to tie flies from Ray Smith. And I, do you have any... I just want to say one thing. Yeah. Uh, anybody that can, you know, get this, purchase this, it's uh, The American Fly Fishing Experience by John Gubbins. It's a fabulous book about Theodore Gordon. And uh, it's you, in have our it, collection. you have it in the library yes. here, which is great. Yes. You know? Okay. So if you can get that, it's a great book to read the history of Theodore Gordon. Thank you. And, and also let me uh, do this because Bert uh, uh, didn't want to do this for himself. This is a shameless <laughs> pitch for Bert's book that he authored, Bert Darrow's Practical Fly Fishing, How to Cast and Fish Naturally, forwarded by Bob Jacklin, who you mentioned earlier, who is the um, owner of Blue Ribbon Flies? Blue, no, uh, it's Bob Jacklin's Flies. Bob Jacklin's Flies, flies. in Montana. Right. Um, and it's an excellent uh, primer on how to catch uh, trout on the fly from Bert Darrow. Right. <laughs> well, you. Bert has been a friend of ours here at the libraries. Since we started this yes. collection, yeah. and I remember wonderful times spent in the back in our in our garden, right. which was which is now a garden, but used to be just a right. uh, backyard. And Bert taught fly casting back there, yeah. And, yeah. and then he also yeah. taught fly tying oh, yeah. in the yeah. old library right. before uh, before it burned. So nice. Bert is a is a true supporter of our. Work I was in fifth grade then, only 20. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank Bert, you so Bert much, Bert, for Bert coming. Thank you for inviting me. Thank oh, you, thank you so Thanks much for coming. Yeah, very, very nice.